And while you're finding your seats, take your Bibles and open to Revelation chapter 20. Our text will be Ephesians chapter 6, but I first want us to go to Revelation chapter 20. Picking up in verse 7. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to enter them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead great and small standing before the throne And books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, The dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage. I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Brothers and sisters, I call your attention to this passage because this is how the story ends. This is final victory. At the last judgment, when the people of God will be finally saved and redeemed and they will be with their God in a new heaven and a new earth where sin will be no more. On that day, the battle is over. That is not today. Today, we fight. But we do know that there is a final victory. The war is won. Christ is the redeemer of God's elect. And we will be with him in glory. So because of this triumph of the king, today we fight. I 
I want us to consider Ephesians chapter 6 in a message that I have titled, Today We Fight. It is the second part of the armor of God. We are considering verses, the passage, verses 10 through 20. But our attention will be on verses 14 through 17 this morning. Paul writing to these believers, picking up in verse 10, he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord. And in the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. It was June 6, 1944, there had been a streak of bad weather in and around Great Britain. On this particular morning, thick, dark clouds hung in the sky. The winds were gusting over 25 miles an hour across the English Channel. There was a solemnness to this day, a hush about it. On this early morn, a myriad of Allied soldiers were about to make history in the execution of Operation Neptune, or as we know it, D-Day. A naval fleet comprised of over 6,000 vessels made its way to the beaches of Normandy. In an effort to turn back the Nazi blitzkrieg and to, and to make advancement on the European continent, the mission was to storm the beaches. We know the operation was a great success, but not without great cost. Soldiers were packed into these transport vessels as they landed on the beaches. They would drop the door to the transport vessel to be met with machine gun fire from the Axis foes. The beaches were lined with mines and barbed wire. Survival was not a guarantee, nor was it even a high probability. Soldiers were literally using bodies of fallen soldiers in front of them to guard themselves from the oncoming bullets and artillery. So, some transport ships ran aground on, the, on, on, on sand barges, and soldiers had to wade 50, 75, even 100 feet through the water just to get to the beach to face the oncoming fire of the enemy. Success was dependent upon courage, resolve, and commitment, and also a refusal to give up or back down no matter the circumstances or the opposition. And I ask the question as I think about those many brave souls that died on that day, what would compel a person to run head first into such conflict? And the answer is this. They were fighting for something greater than themselves. They were all in on the cause for which they were unified, for which they were fighting. They knew that they had been called upon in that very hour to resist and to push back against the evil of their day. Brothers and sisters, they fought, they bled, and they died for freedom on earth. A most noble and virtuous cause, I would say. As we think of those many brave souls, we must also understand we too have been called to fight. We have been called to fight for something greater than ourselves, for the most noble and virtuous cause there absolutely is. 
We have been called to fight in the advancement of God's kingdom. To be a Christian is to be enlisted in the army of God. And so today, brothers and sisters, we fight. And if I've ever shared a message with you of one that I am passionate about, it is this one. Far too many of us live in defeat. We live in defeat to sin, self, and Satan. We neglect the armor of God. We have a passive Christianity. We run from conflict. I want to be among those that are running into the battle and not running away from it. I want to be among those brave souls proclaiming Jesus is king and nobody else is. We are called to fight. We are called to labor for the kingdom of God. And so this morning, as we will pick up concerning God's armor that he supplies, I want you to be mindful of wearing the armor. To engage in a spiritual conflict and spiritual battle for the advancement of God's kingdom. We will consider the pieces of armor this morning and we will conclude our message this evening as we look at armor being fastened and then displayed through the apostle Paul. But what we have here in Ephesians chapter 6 is a very famous passage, something that we are mindful of, vivid imagery, aggressive passage, warlike. The Apostle Paul in verses 10, 11, 10 through 13 has given the call to war, to be strong and to take up the armor of God. He has given us the challenge that we face. It is clear we wage war against Satan, the schemes of Satan, Satan's forces. And then he has given us the charge. Stand firm. This doesn't mean stand still. It means to stand firm. We are Christians who stand firm, but we are not standing still. We are to be gaining ground. And so under this first and probably the only heading we'll consider this morning is the armor applied. The armor applied. Notice with me here in verse 14. He says, stand, therefore. It is not like he has said it enough. He has told us in verse 11 to stand against the schemes. In verse 13, that we might be able to withstand. And then at the end of verse 13, stand firm. And then he again, he says in verse 14, stand, therefore. Do you, se do you sense what the apostle is saying here? This is aggressive. What he means when he says stand, he's talking about be upright, be alert, be ready, be willing, be able. Stand, therefore, first having fastened on the belt of truth. Paul is taking vivid word pictures here, and he is making spiritual application to what we would see of a Christian Soldier. So what does he mean here by the belt of truth? Paul is not simply describing uh, a belt that you would put on your pants for, for, to keep your, your, your trousers up. No, Paul is not talking like that. Quite literally, he is saying of the soldier, gird up your loins. Soldiers would wear this long, flowing, one-piece tunic. And as it would flow, it would, it, would be, it would be fine for them to wear, but it would drape down. But soldiers that were on duty needed to pull up their tunic to about thigh height. They would tie it off with a girdle or a belt so that they would be agile. They would be ready. A soldier, you knew a soldier was on duty if his loins were girded up or if he had his belt fastened. If the, flu, if the tunic was down, he was off duty. And so the soldier would have his loins girded. And it signified preparedness, readiness. The soldier would be more agile to move. He would not be tripped up over his own garments. For in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, Peter would say, Therefore, preparing your minds for action, or girding up the loins of your mind. And so Paul ties this, this truth here, this, this picture, this action of girding or fastening yourself, being prepared, he ties it to truth. And so why does he tie it to truth? 
Well, what he says here is to fasten on the belt is the first action you must take in applying the armor. It all flows from here. There's logic in how he describes every single piece. There are steps that must be taken. Foundationally, in the battle, our, what, we, what we rely upon is truth. Truth is foundational to who we are. Paul's pulling this imagery here also from Isaiah chapter 11, verse 5. Concerning the servant of Jehovah, he says, Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness, or truth, the belt of his loins. So we must understand foundational to who we are, to the battle we face, is truth. And I would even argue that is the battleground outside in the, in the realm of ideas today. What is truth? This means that from the, very, from the very beginning, from the very start of the fight, the spiritual battle that we are in, we must be rooted and grounded in truth. We must live lives of truthfulness. We reject error. We reject falsehood. We stand for what is true, for what is good, and for what is beautiful because all of those things come from God. There, what this also means here is we have put on the belt of truth. There's no place in our lives to be double-minded, double-tongued. Remember, as we would read even at the end in Revelation 20, that liars will not inherit the kingdom. And so we are to be people of truth. Girding up our loins, prepared for action, rooted in the truth of the gospel, the truth of God's word, standing firm in this way, for truth. You know, there's a saying, right? We, we say, you know, speak your truth. That's not a true statement. You don't just have truth. Truth is objective. Truth is not subjective. Truth is not relative. We either believe it or we don't. I don't define it. I submit to it. We submit to truth. Jesus is the truth. So consider here, first call to action, to war, to the battle, to the fight, is to be ready by grounding ourselves, fastening ourselves with truth, to be people of truth. And then from there, as, our, as we've got our, 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 our belt of truth fastened on us, we are to then put on the breastplate of righteousness. Paul certainly has in mind here the armor of Yahweh in Isaiah 59, 17, where he speaks of uh, Yahweh's armor, and he says he put on righteousness as a breastplate. The breastplate on the, on the Roman soldier would cover you from, from neck to about mid-thigh area. And it served to protect all the vital organs, especially the heart. They're often made of metal, mostly bronze, but it would protect all the vital organs here. And he's saying that this breastplate is to cover us. I think a modern day example would be to wear your bulletproof vest, Teflon, to be covered. Commonly, the breastplates would have a back piece attached to them, but Paul makes no mention of a back piece here. Only something to cover you on the front. I believe implied here is that the Christian is not to turn around. Or to back down in the fight, there is no retreat, there is no surrender. And he would call this breastplate to cover the vital organs, the breastplate of righteousness. What is being implied here is that we are to guard our hearts. We are to, we are to guard our hearts by being one of uprightness and integrity of character. This is to define us. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, from the mouth of Jesus, he says, you are the light of the world. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works. Here's your breastplate of righteousness. That they might see the righteousness coming from you, of the integrity of your character, of your deeds, of your actions. And what? look at you and say, wow, you're a really good person? No, that they would see that your light would shine before others, that they might see your good works and do what? Give glory to your Father who is in heaven. We don't practice righteousness for recognition. 
unless it's the recognition of God to him. And so let's make application of this as we would wear this breastplate, we would wear righteousness. Protect your hearts, brothers and sisters. Protect your hearts from lust, from idolatry. Commit yourself to righteousness, active obedience. You are not passively getting holier. Aggressive holiness, knowing that the righteousness of Jesus has been what has been given to us. Now, Paul is not here talking about put on necessarily the imputed righteousness of Christ. It is because of the imputed righteousness of Christ that we have been enabled and desire to even live lives of righteousness. It is not a righteousness that Paul speaks of here unto salvation, but because of salvation, we put on the breastplate of righteousness. Brothers and sisters, we are called to fight. Consider here this next piece. After you, after you have, st- he says, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Paul goes head to toe here because it matters. In Nahum 1.15, we would read, Behold upon the mountains the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace. Nahum is talking about the gospel. As for shoes for your feet, put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Notice how the belt and the breastplate lead to the shoes. First, you get yourself ready by being immersed in truth. You are living a life of righteousness, guarding yourself, guarding your heart, guarding yourself against sin. And if you are living, if you are immersed in truth and you are living righteously, aren't you compelled to share the gospel? That this would be this order of outfitting truthfulness and righteousness lead to a readiness to bring the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you are not fastened in truth, if you are not committed to righteousness, understand this, believer. Your testimony is compromised. Your readiness is hindered. Sometimes we fall into a a backslidden state. The last thought on our mind is that we want to go share the gospel. How can I do that? I'm not living it. My righteousness is, 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 I'm, I'm struggling. I'm not immersed in truth because I'm believing the lies of the world. So therefore, my righteousness is, is, is suffering. What am I going to go do? Share the gospel and show everyone how big of a hypocrite I am? Those become the thoughts, right? But if we are immersed in truth and we are practicing holiness and righteousness, we are living out gospel-consistent lives. Yes, we struggle. Yes, we will fall. But we won't stay there. He says, as shoes for your feet. If Paul has in mind the Roman footwear, which I certainly believe he does, these aren't sandals. This isn't a pair of Birkenstocks that he's talking about here. These are military boots that he's speaking of. Josephus, the first century historian, describes them as thickly studded with sharp nails. Both Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar saw great military success because of their soldiers' footwear. They were able to cover great distances over rough terrain. These shoes or these boots that they would wear literally would have, some said, spikes up to two to three inches. It'd be like nails on the bottom of their feet, thickly studded. This was like a really big pair of cleats that they were wearing. And it would cause them to be ready so that they could traverse any terrain, that obstacles in front of them weren't so much obstacles any longer. Around a, a month ago or so, I went up north with my son, um, and we went to go, um, we've got this idea that we're going to climb um, 100 mountains in New Hampshire. And so we've started this, and um, 
knocking out some of the mountains off of our bucket list. And as we went hiking, uh, we started to reach higher elevations, and the, the, the conditions changed. What was fine down on the ground, uh, we started to come across snow, and there was some ice, some really thick ice. But we were equipped. We were ready. We had in our bags, we had uh, 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 micro spikes that you would put on your feet so that if you came across this type of terrain, you would be equipped and ready to traverse it. And I think often as he talks here about the shoes for your feet and these thickly studded shoes by the Roman soldiers, I think about that day with my son and the readiness that we had because we were prepared. We had our spikes. And as we would take our spikes and we'd put them on our shoes, we were just playing plodding right through, passing other people struggling along the way, just just trucking along, going right up the elevation, coming right back down. We could walk over snow, sleet, ice. He thought it was amazing. He thought it was the most amazing thing that ice wasn't slippery to him anymore. We trusted our equipment. We were ready. And as I think often here and we think, Paul ties in the shoes with readiness. Let me ask you, are you ready to bring the gospel of peace? Are you equipped? Are you immersed in truth? Are you you guarding your heart with righteousness? Are you ready to cover whatever ground, whatever terrain, to bring the good news of Christ, that there is peace in Jesus? Romans chapter 10, verse 15, and how are we to preach unless... They are sent. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. That's what he's talking about here. May we be soldiers of beautiful feet. I don't want shiny new spikes, I want worn shoes. I want your shoes to be worn. I want your your shoes that have brought the readiness of the gospel of peace to have covered many distances, long distances, put miles on them. That you've tried to traverse the highways and the byways and that you are compelling people, come in. That you would go to seek and to save and to reach the lost. Proclaiming the Prince of Peace, most importantly proclaiming Jesus is King. Christian, are your boots worn? Are they broken in or are they shiny new? We are called to fight. We are not called to cloister into our comfortable corner of Christianity and just stay in this little circle. And it'll all be good if we just stay in our circle. No, we don't have a theology of defeat. That everything's just going to keep getting bad and worse and worse all around us. Yes, the times are bad. But it is in the bad times that the opportunities are the greatest. Let's not think, let's go out and lose this one for Jesus. No, we are to go and we are to wage war and we are to fight and we are to see victory. Do you believe the kingdom of God is expanding or shrinking? If you believe it's shrinking, you're going to cloister up. Also understand God is sovereign over the end. God is also sovereign over the means. And so what does Jesus say to his apostles at the end of Matthew? Go. Go, therefore. But don't go alone. No, don't go alone. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Christian, Christ is with you. We are not to go at it alone. We are not on our own. The apostle would say here, put on readiness. These thickly studded military boots that the Roman soldiers would wear with these sharp nails would also allow them to hold their ground as well, to stand firm. And we are called to do this very same thing. We are to stand firm. We are to stand firm on the promises of God. 
We are to stand firm on the promises of the gospel. We stand firm on the truth that Jesus Christ died for sinners. And he has made peace through the blood of his cross. We stand firm and we will not back down or turn away from this. We stand firm that he is the only way, the truth, and the life. And we share this gospel with all, to all people without distinction. Christians, stand firm. Consider here now the shield of faith. And the shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Let me ask you this question. When is a bad time to share the gospel? Be ready. Peter says, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in you. In season and out of season. That's all seasons. And in all circumstances here, take up the shield of faith. The soldier's shield was an oblong-shaped shield. It would, be, it would measure roughly uh, four feet in length, about two and a half feet wide. It wasn't so much square, but it was a circular shape. You know, the material of the shield was made of wood primarily, covered in leather or hide, and then strapped with uh, various iron or bronze. And when the soldiers would line up in formation, they would form a shield wall. I, I just, I guess that just, I have to talk about church membership, right? You know, form a shield wall. Because you know what? When you lined up together, you need to be together, right? So as we line up together, there's a plug to church membership in every message. But listen, we are to be together. Your shield is good, might protect you, but your shield wall protects a lot more than just yourself. So they would form this wall of shields. And this shield, Paul would say, is a shield of faith. A crouching soldier would be fully protected. There's no need to parse the meaning of faith here. What Paul means by this faith that he speaks of, this shield of faith, it is the exercise of faith. It is exercising faith in the object of our faith, Jesus Christ, where we find full protection. Christian, faith is the protector against all the flaming darts of the evil one. That's what Paul would say here. That you would take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. So, interesting on these shields made of wood, the enemy would think, well, if I set the shield on fire, I would incinerate it. Well, what the Romans would do is that they would take the hides before they put them on the shields and they would soak them. They would soak them in water for a long period of time so that when the hides were applied to their shields and the flaming darts would come, they would be ex extinguished upon impact. And so Paul has this very much in mind as they know this, that as Satan and his darts would come towards us, these actual projectile missiles is a better way to, to render this, that they would, be, they would be rendered obsolete and extinguished because faith, faith is to protect us against all of his darts. Consider Christian in Pilgrim's Progress. A good sermon should talk about church membership and should reference John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, and that, I think, is checks the, the list here. But consider Christian and Pilgrim's Progress. If you haven't read the book, oh, you need to. Just beyond the palace beautiful lies the Valley of Humiliation, and Christian has scarcely entered it when he sees coming towards him a, what is described as a foul fiend named Apollyon. He is a hideous monster with scales like a fish, wings like a dragon, feet like a bear, mouth like a lion. Fire and smoke pour out of a hole in his belly. And the monster asks Christian, Whence come you? And whither are you bound? Or in modern English, where did you come from? And where are you going? When Christian replies that he is coming from the city of destruction and bound for the city of Zion, Apollyon points out that he is the prince and god of the city of destruction and all the surrounding territory. 
That Christian is therefore one of his subjects and owes him obedience. That he should obey his command and turn around and go home. I hope you can see the scene in your mind right now as this battle is about to happen. Christian refuses, announcing his, in, his intention of continuing in the king's highway, the way of holiness. No doubt this battle that is about to take place in Pilgrim's Progress is John Bunyan's word picture of Ephesians chapter 6. With that, Apollyon blocks the path and lets, and lets fly at Christian with a flaming dart, which Christian deflects with his shield. But then comes a shower of flaming darts. As the text says, it was thick as hail, inflicting many wounds. Christian sword at that moment seemed useless to him, for Apollyon stayed out of reach as he moved around, hurling these darts against Christian. The battle rages on for some time, but we know what happens. Christian prevails. He reaches for his sword, and he thrusts it into the beast. That would not be his last struggle along the way. But with the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit and the full armor that God had given to him, Christian overcomes the evil one. And what are these flaming darts of the evil one? Well, you'd look back and you would think of the schemes of Satan. It's the schemes of the devil. You see right there in the text. Verse, 10, verse 11. We've been spending some significant amount of time in Job. Consider Job as he was assaulted with the flaming darts of the evil one. He had a rough go of it, didn't he? What are some other ways that we would even think of these flaming darts that would come at us? Well, think about Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, sword, danger. According to, to one commentator, he says these flaming missiles bring about doubt, Others, lust, greed, vanity, envy. You might get thoughts in your mind like this. Do you really think God loves you? How could God love you? Look at what you just did. You know what you did last night. Yes, God is love, but not to you. Or maybe something like, you can't really be sure you're a Christian. Look at how much you sin. Compare yourself with that other person. Look at that person. They're better than you. Those are flaming darts. That'll cause doubt. That'll cause envy. That'll cause jealousy. Look at how put together everybody else's life is. They got it. They, look at them. Look how blessed those people are. I'm not blessed. Those are flaming darts. You're worthless. You don't matter. Just give up. If we're honest with ourselves, we've thought this way. We've struggled with this, this type of thinking. We've harbored resentments and bitterness and sins because we've let down the shield of faith. And we've let the lies that can come from within and without shape our thinking. How about this one? Find your identity in what you do. Men, you do this a lot. What do you do? And then you go on to talk about your work. That's, that's fine, but do we find identity in that? My identity is not in what I do. But it's in Christ. Your identity is in Christ. So your value is fixed. Your worth is, 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 is of extreme worth because it is in Christ that your identity is found. And you believe this by faith. How about this one? Take a bite. It'll make you feel good. Oh, sin has its lures for a moment, but it is painful and met with much sorrow and regret in time. 
These are flaming darts. And what must we do, brothers and sisters? We must fight. We must take up the shield of faith. We must fight by faith. Faith is like a muscle. The more you exercise it, the stronger it becomes. And we do not dwell on the darts, but we look onward and we look upward as the darts might assail us. And there might be times where our shield is low and it, is, it seems weak. And there are times where a dart penetrates. We must always look outward and upward. That is the object of our faith. We stand on the promises, rely on the word of God, push back by faith. How do I know that God loves me? I don't look at what I did. I don't look at my performance. I don't look at, at, at my sinful self. I gotta look at someone greater. I gotta look outside of myself to see the love of God. I have to look to the cross. I have to look to the empty tomb. I have to look to my Savior. Do with the eyes of faith, but it's not wishful thinking. I look with confident expectation. God loves me because of the work that he did in and through Jesus Christ. That the greatest display of love we have ever seen is the suffering of the Son of God for the people of God. God loves me because he did not spare his own son, but gave himself up for us all. I am a great sinner. He is a great savior. Remember this, Christian, as doubt might creep in and might, might almost cripple you. He who started a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. God start, what God starts, God finishes. It's not dependent upon you. That's freeing. That's liberating. So I'm not jealous of my brother or sister who is successful. We're on the same team. I rejoice in your successes and your accomplishments. I rejoice that God is doing a great work in you. I rejoice that you are named among the people of God. We love each other. We stand together. You are lined up with me shield to shield. There's no infighting. We are a community of faith. We are the people of God. We stand against a common foe and we will not allow a dart to penetrate our ranks. Shield down, man down. So let me encourage you with these words. You might see a brother or sister among us right now that is struggling in the faith. You might be a brother or sister right now struggling in the faith. And it took all that you got just to get in the pew today. I'm glad you're here. I am so glad you're here. And I want to encourage you, weary Christian, fight. Fight, take up the shield. Lay hold of Christ by faith. Preach the gospel to yourself. And understand this, you are a great sinner. You are a great sinner, but we know a greater savior. Jesus is a great savior. savior. If you are struggling, and you are struggling in faith, and you're just struggling, do not isolate yourself. Talk to somebody. It's okay to say, I'm struggling, pray for me. The worst thing you can do is isolate and leave your shield down. What would happen to Christian if he, had, if he had, did not have his shield? He was lying open to the ambush of the evil one. Don't go at this alone. Line up with your brothers and sisters. Talk to somebody. Say, I am struggling with doubts. My shield has been down. The flaming darts have assaulted me. I need help. It is better to be honest with yourself and to others than to pretend like you're okay because that's what church people do. A means of strengthening the faith is being in the covenant community of God's people the local church. An isolated warrior is a defenseless warrior and a defeated warrior. So understand this, brothers and sisters, today we fight. And we fight together. And also now consider the helmet of salvation. And take the helmet of salvation. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8, he says, for a helmet, he says, the hope of salvation the soldier's helmet doesn't need much by way of description. A leather helmet pl plated with brass and other metals. To leave one's head unprotected is the height of foolishness. 
So whereas faith protects us from the onslaught of the darts of the evil one, the assurance of salvation keeps our minds right in the battle. It is the assurance of our salvation. It is the assurance that God is saving us. God has saved us. God will save us. We wage war in this world against sin and Satan. We must guard our minds. We must guard our minds with the assurance of salvation that God has promised. And as I said, think of salvation in three stages. First, understand that God has saved us. This is regeneration. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace you have been saved. Through, you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. God's salvation is God's gift. And what God gives, God doesn't take away. And so you have been saved. But also understand this, he is saving you. This is sanctification. 2 Corinthians 4, 16, Therefore we do not lose hearts. For though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. God is saving you. God is doing a work in you. And understand that God will save us. The three stages. So it's regeneration, sanctification, and finally glorification. We saw that at the, at the very beginning in Revelation. But in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, we are reminded who, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last days. So we fight because our past is redeemed, our present is being sanctified, and our future is sure because of the promises of God. And salvation assures us that the battle belongs to the Lord. The Scottish commentator John Eady wrote, Quote, it is the assurance of being interested in this salvation that guards the head. He who knows that he is safe, who feels that he is pardoned and sanctified, he possesses this helmet. That is a very powerful quote. And I must ask you, are you interested in this salvation? Do you have an interest in Jesus Christ? Are you confident that what God has said will come true? Are you positive, are you certain that the war is already won? And the answer is yes, because the seed of the woman crushed the head of the serpent. And so let us apply this. Since I have been saved by God and I am being saved by God, I will fight for personal holiness. I will fight for the advancement of the gospel. And since one day I will be saved, I will continue this fight until that day. Christian soldiers never retire. You might reach that great age, which keeps getting older and older, what, 67 now? And think, all right, time for seashells on the beaches. No, there's no retirement. There's no laying down the sword. There's no taking the helmet off. There's no removal of the breastplate. Why? Because your enemy never retires. And so here the sword of the Spirit. Finally, verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is the most offensive item in the set of armor. It is not the only offensive item, but it is the most offensive item. Now, this sword described here by the apostle is not the lightweight spear of the Roman hoplite, no, nor is it the large two-handed broadsword that many a warrior would use. No, but what he describes here is the short two-edged cut and thrust sword. It is the sword of gladiators. It is the swords of the heavily armored soldiers. It is a champion sword that he speaks of here for its amazing versatility, its usefulness, and its power. It is a weapon to be used in close combat, this sword that he speaks of. And Paul calls the sword of the Spirit and gives us the descriptor. It's the word of God. It is the word of God. It is the gospel of God. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 25, But the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word, this word is the good news that was preached to you. 
When is the first time that the gospel is preached? In all of scripture, you know this. In Genesis chapter three, Adam and Eve have fallen. They suffer under the great condemnation of a holy God. In that instant, they should have been smote to dust. They had committed cosmic treason against a holy God. They defied the creator. And as the curse is to come down from the hand of the Almighty, before he curses Adam, before he curses Eve for their disobedience, he looks to the serpent. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, he gives the promise of the gospel to the serpent. Understand this, when the gospel is first mentioned in the Bible, it is a, it is a declaration of victory from God to the serpent. It's not an invitation to come, but it is, it is, a, it is a proclamation of certain defeat and victory for the serpent. This is the good news that was preached to us. It is the proclamation of the gospel. God gives grace, always gives grace to his people. And so when we think about this sword of the spirit, yes, it is the gospel preached. It is the holy word of God recorded in the pages of scripture. Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, we we know this verse. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It is the word of Christ. We would, we would read in, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, from his mouth comes in sharp, two-edged sword. It is the word of God. It is the sword of the Spirit. It is called the sword of the Spirit because it has been given to us by the Spirit through the application of his word to our hearts. So let us conclude with some application even here. Christian soldier, you are called to wield the sword. We gain victory through the word of God, convicting and changing hearts, as well as conforming us to the image of Christ. The word of God is powerful. The word of God, it is the only book that as you read it, it reads you. It is the book that changes lives because it is the very mouth of God. It is not like any other book on the shelf. It is the special revelation of God that tells us exactly who we are, exactly why our world's messed up, exactly what needs to be done in order for us to be saved. Think of Jesus after his baptism. He goes off into the the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And what does he do? What weapon does he bring with him? He says, it is written. It is written. It is written as Jesus wields the sword to the serpent. So Christian, how do you approach your Bible? How do you approach your Bible? Let me encourage you, commit yourself to memorization of the scriptures. Psalm 119, 11, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. What soldier in, battle would inten- in, in a battle would intentionally leave his sword behind? Oh, how many churchgoers neglect to invest themselves in the Word of God. Our Bible intake is called Sunday to Sunday. Spurgeon said, quote, there is dust enough on some of your Bibles to write damnation with your fingers. Study the Word of God. Know the Word of God. Apply the Word of God. The more you learn the Bible, the more you love the Bible. Remember, you are a soldier, you are a warrior, and the word is your weapon. Let the sword do its job. So Christian, this is the armor of God applied. Are you ready for battle? Are you fastened in truth? Are you practicing righteousness, the act of obedience in your heart? Are you ready and are you going with the gospel? Are you preaching the gospel to yourself and to others? And are you withstanding the attacks by faith? You will be attacked. All those who desire to live a godly life will be persecuted. And does the assurance of God's salvation 
guard your mind and, your str- and strengthen you for the battle? Are you wielding the sword? Are you trusting in the word of God to do the work of God according to the perfect plan of God? Christian, today we fight. Lord, we thank you that you have not left us to our own devices, but as you have called us, you have equipped us, and you have given us the panoply, the full set, the complete armor. Oh, Lord, may we not neglect the items that you've given to us for victory as we rely upon you and your strength. Father, help us. Make us mindful of the conflict of the war within and the war without, that we fight against our own remaining sin, fight for holiness, purity, for the advancement of your gospel on earth. The Lord, may it be said of us that we are found faithful in these days, banded together. May we be a shield wall here in Quidneset for the advancement of your gospel, for the good of your people, and most importantly, for the glory that is due your name. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.